Star Trek's legendary USS Enterprise NC-1701 is easily one of the most iconic ship designs of all time. Its silhouette is immediately recognizable even to those who don't call themselves Trekkies. And this understandably left quite big shoes to fill for the new production designer Jonathan Lee for Paramount's latest Star Trek installation, Strange New Worlds. So does the new design direction live up to its lauded precedent? And how can one even begin to reinvent a modern legend? Hey guys, I'm Morphologist, and while I'm not designing buildings in the real world, on my free time I like to make videos I call an architect reviews where I take a closer look at things in the digital realm or otherwise, and today I'm taking a look at the new Enterprise from Strange New Worlds. Specifically today, we're going to take a closer look at its interior design. I'm going to examine its real-world inspirations and give you my own opinion on its successes and shortcomings. And as a bit of a bonus to this episode, I've decided to utilize some of my skills in the real world to build some sections of the ship so that I can show you through the video with some fancier visual aids. If by the end you think I deserve it and you want to see more, don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button to show your support. One other way you can support me though is by checking out the generous sponsor of today's video, Incogni. You probably already know that whenever you do stuff online, there's a huge number of companies that collect your information, stuff like your address, your social security number, your employment history, etc. But what you might not know is that they actually buy and sell and trade that information. Some of those companies can use that information to do things like adjust your credit score, or others can use it for more nefarious purposes. Worst of all is if any of those companies get hacked, your identity could be at risk, which is probably what happened to me a couple years ago when I lost my identity and a bunch of money was stolen from me. That's where Incogni can help. There are laws that allow you to force those companies to delete your data, and Incogni knows exactly how to use them. Their service automatically reaches out and applies the appropriate law and language to get them to remove that data. I just signed up and found out there were over 90 companies with my personal information. No wonder I keep getting invited to join annoying scam investor groups. So if you want to be just a bit more sure that your personal information isn't getting into the wrong hands, or if maybe you just want to stop a few of those annoying spam emails you're getting, you can get your personal data off the internet today with Incogni. Just head on over to incogni.com slash morphologist and use my code morphologist to get 60% off an Incogni purchase. And don't worry, if you don't like it, you can always get your money back with Incogni's 30-day money-back guarantee. Again, that's incogni.com slash morphologist and use code morphologist to get 60% off your order. So it would be impossible to talk about the new design of the USS Enterprise without first talking about the legendary original. While many regard it as a masterpiece of design for science fiction television, the reality is that the genre wasn't really well regarded at the time for syndicated television. So the budget that they allotted to an American aviation and mechanical artist Matt Jeffries to put together the set was actually very small. Despite this limitation, though, Jeffrey still managed to pull off a successful design, drawing influence from his aviation background and neo-futuristic architecture to craft a minimalistic design that ended up working quite well in context. I mean, after all, the idea of what a futuristic spacecraft would look like in the distant future wasn't something that was well explored at the time. In the eyes of the public, computers and spaceship interfaces were complex walls of lights and incomprehensible switches, so a contrasting, simple design would have come off as very futuristic. But as successful as the design was, it would ultimately not likely play well for a modern audience today if they were just to make a one-to-one -one copy of it. After all, sets back then were designed for much lower definition and smaller screens than our 4K televisions, phones, and monitors today. And it's also worth noting that their budget is quite a bit higher than it was back then. Clearly then, an updated reinterpretation was always going to happen. The success then would lie in the approach to the reimagining. Luckily, Jonathan Lee, the production designer of Strange New Worlds, has not only an appreciation for the original design, but a good understanding of the influences that led to its design in the 1960s. The work of Charles and Ray Eames, Mies van der Rohe, and maybe most prominently, architect Eero Saarinen come to mind. If the name Aero Sarnin though doesn't sound familiar to you, you probably will know his work. He was responsible for the design of the Gateway Arch in St. Louis and the iconic tulip set that you'll see in a few spaces scattered about Enterprise. 
and probably my favorite, the TWA terminal at JFK. And this example in particular is probably the most obvious example of neo-futurism that I think probably played a role in influencing both the new and old Enterprise design. Take a look at its beautiful sweeping organic curves, its chromatic color palette interrupted by vibrant splashes of red seating and carpeting that look like they could be straight off the Enterprise. Put this architecture next to the interior and exterior of the Enterprise and I think you'll start to see the relationship. Now this type of architecture might not be that shocking for many of you today, as we've seen a number of examples of this neo-futuristic type architecture coming out of the likes of star architects like Santiago Calatrava and Zaha Hadid, but this guy Eero Sarnin was one of the first, and he was the one who actually inspired those famous contemporary architects that we know today. So then armed with this knowledge of influence, let's return to the Enterprise for our brief tour. But before we go, I just want to say that there are a lot of great spaces on the Enterprise that I would have loved to talk about, but I've only got time for a few, so I've decided to select a handful of my favorites to talk about. And we'll start with the way we get there, the corridors. So straight from the get-go, your now more informed eyes will likely start to spot the neo-modernist influence here in the halls. It's quite reminiscent of Sarnin's work. But that's not all. Even the color palette of warm whites interrupted by vibrant red details like those on the ceiling, the floor lines, and the doors all come together to attempt to achieve the same emotional results that Sarnin did with his designs. But there's also the influence of the original Star Trek corridors here if you look closely. Check out that rooftop silhouette, the way it sweeps up, comes down in the center, and then goes back up on the other side. See something similar here in the original set photos? This was a great little tasteful nod to the original design. Even the color palette is similar with the red ceiling and the gray walls. The only difference is that the floors here are carpet in the original set, whereas in the new one they're hard surfaces. I also particularly like how one side of the hallway is angled to suggest the outer edge of the saucer section, giving you an idea of what direction that would be walking down this hall. It gives you a better sense of your location on the ship. But it's also the execution of the details that I find to be pretty successful. Take a look at this door, for example. The door isn't just a flat surface and painted red. It's got a nice, subtle, black, thin line in the center that sweeps down in a fillet, becoming a thinner line at the bottom. It's a nice contrast to highlight the opening in an otherwise similar surface. And even the red part isn't just flat. I also love how they added this light here on the door header that sweeps up and goes around, and even the nice floorboard lighting that can be activated in a case of emergency to be able to light the way when smoke may fill the hall. It's a nice subtle touch that maybe is a nod to aircraft design. And of course, I couldn't possibly ignore the fun little paneling that they've done. Every once in a while, you'll see a flat panel interrupted by an opening where they expose some piping or some boxes with some very classic jelly bean lights just like on the old Enterprise and even the color palette of some of these conduit pipes are like they were taken straight off the old set. And by the way, if you're wondering how I got all these shots, I actually made a model based off the set photos so that I could show you guys this in a more interactive format. But I think it's time for a bit of change of scenery. Let's take a look at some of the crew quarters, specifically Captain Pike's. The images and video you're seeing here of Pike's quarters were given to me courtesy of the talented CGI artist, Richard Leach, who was also generous enough to send me a few additional renderings of it to give you guys a better look. Much like in the quarters, Pike's quarters overall take on a much more bright and optimistic tonality, fitting with the goal of the show to be a much more positive take on modern Star Trek. This is in contrast to the dark and unreadable spaces of other modern Trek shows like that on Discovery. The space takes on a clear nautical inspiration, with portholes coupled with the introduction of well-lit structural elements that suggest a place may be in the rear section of a tall ship in the Age of Sail. In fact, if you look at one of the walls, you'll see that there's an old tall ship model on display. That's a very overt nod, I would say. Even the materials are a nod to the nautical inspiration, something that you might see on, say, a modern yacht. And I also want to point out the mid-century furniture. Now this stuff, much of it was actually designed in the 1960s when the original Star Trek came out. 
only the simple designs of this furniture are so timeless that even today they would look right at home with a contemporary work of architecture and often do feature in new works. So this is an awesome authentic nod to the original Star Trek that uses legitimate furniture from the time but in a way that looks a lot more contemporary to our modern eyes. I also really like the bedroom design which incorporates a sliding panel that looks like it can close off the sleeping quarters to make a more intimate space for other types of activities. Overall I'm really impressed by the design of the space and it's so well crafted I feel like I would want to live in this space myself. It feels like something that a human would want to actually occupy unlike the cold and unwelcoming spaces in the Discovery ship. I mean, the sh oh, never mind. Personally, I've always been a fan of the larger, more luxurious spaces like those found on the old Enterprise from TNG. These sterile spaces that they've been doing in recent Trek have always been a bit of a disappointment, so it's great to see them return to form with these comfortable, optimistic-looking interiors. But that's enough for Pike's Quarters because there's two more spaces I want to take you guys through. The next is one that I couldn't possibly avoid. It's the bridge. Probably the most important space to get right on the Enterprise was the bridge. The new design borrows heavily from the original layout, and it should. It's technically an earlier incarnation of the same NC-1701 that Kirk will later captain. Just as in the original, then, the entrance is right off center so that it can get in shot with fantastic three-quarter views of anybody sitting in the command area. The technical display is just like in the original wrap around the central command area, featuring updated larger monitors for a more modern audience with a greater number of interfaces than in the original. Again, a bigger budget, it makes it look a little bit more contemporary. Despite this update though, if you look closely, the proportions and layout still draw from the original. So again, taking the new stuff and adding it in with the original layout to make a design that feels related and of the same family. I particularly love the half-circle layout of the interfaces at the various stations, again something we saw on the original bridge. Shifting our focus now to the center command area, this is also really similar to the original. It's circular just like on the original, and it feels true to form with the captain's chair raised just above and behind the helm and navigation terminals. Also, notice the red railings that go around the central area just as on the original. Overall, what they did here was basically take the layout of the original and just update the detailing for a more modern audience on 4K screens. This was very tastefully done and probably the biggest difference is one that probably needed to be changed. It's the larger view screen. If you look on the original, the view screen was really tiny, but this made sense for audiences at the time. The idea of having a massive wraparound screen was just a little bit too futuristic for the audience at the time. This makes a lot more sense to have it wrap around today as anything less would have seemed almost comical to our contemporary eyes. Overall then, I think they nailed the bridge. It's colorful, bright, and optimistic. It captures the original soul, I think, of the original bridge, but does it in a way that is more contemporary for a modern audience. It's a great combination, and personally, it's my favorite bridge of modern Trek. But now, I think it's time for our last stop on our Enterprise tour, and that's where the crew goes for some R&R between shifts, and personally, my favorite place to hang out on Enterprise, the Forward Lounge. So when I was preparing for the video, one of the things I wanted to do to enhance the experience for you guys and increase my own personal knowledge of the design was to involve not just images, but some 3D models in which I could interactively discuss the spaces aboard the ship. Unfortunately, access to models of the current Enterprise are near non-existent, which is probably a poor excuse for why I spent nearly all of my free time last week working on the corridors of Deck 5 in addition to the forward lounge itself. I mean, if I had to show you guys the corridor and had no spaces behind it, I feel I would have cheated both you and me out of something cool. This offered me though some unexpected insight into the design of Enterprise that you won't find on any schematic or plan. And that's that the design is kind of off, maybe. Let me explain. So when I was trying to figure out the curve of the corridor for making my model, since there were no drawings available at the time, I had to basically scale draw the entire Enterprise to try to get the curve of that corridor correct. Taking into account my estimated depth of the space, going off measuring the size of the tulip set, which is something that I do know and we can see on the show. But then I realized I also needed to understand the height of the space, so I had to model the hull. 
And basically by doing these completely unnecessary things for this video, spending way too much time, I came to the realization that if the lounge was as tall and deep as it's shown on the show, that you couldn't possibly enter in to crew quarters off the same hallway and be that close to the edge of the hall like we see in Pike's quarters. So clearly they fudged some of the spaces for the show and it probably isn't the true layout if they were to build a ship. But I mean, it's a show. It's not a real ship. I'm, I just thought it was cool and you guys might want to know. Anyway, you guys came here for the design, so let's get back to that. The reason why it's my favorite on the ship is because it's not only the lounge and my favorite location on the Enterprise D was 10 Ford, but because it's in one of the best positions in the whole ship. It's right at the bow and has the largest portholes on the ship. If I saw a picture of this and I lived in this universe, I'd be like, I'm signing up for Starfleet today. If I hadn't already, I mean, if I lived in that universe, I definitely would be in Starfleet. The cool lighting and atmosphere give a sense of it being in some high-end location on the top of some modern skyscraper in, say, New York City or Hong Kong. It also has a number of clear nods to the mid-century and neo-modernist design influences that I've talked about throughout this video. Notice the red benches, once again, reminiscent of Sarnin's TWA terminal, and the use of Sarnin's tulip set itself. And while we've already seen it in a number of places throughout the ship, the integration of lighting into the structural elements is also a great little touch. And while much of this interior space is hard surface, making for a possibly acoustically difficult space to be in, the addition of these little elements on the wall could possibly trap sound and allow the sound in the space as a whole to feel a little bit better. Which leads me to the section of the space that required a bit of creative interpretation. Unfortunately, there aren't any photos of the other side of the set because in reality, the set wasn't ever built. What you see on screen is actually a projection onto a huge monitor, like on ILM's version of the volume. I decided then to take bits and pieces that we've seen from other spaces and combine them into something that I think might fit in a mid-century design or a neo-modernist design of architecture of the time, and this is the result. Hopefully it feels like it was always there the whole time. I also spent some time designing the entrance to the lounge as there wasn't anything in the plans or on screen to show it, and I thought it'd be a nice thing to do to have the entrances not be directly in from the hallway, but to go off on a little branching hallway so that you had a little bit more privacy and acoustic comfort as you entered. Also visual comfort so that if you're on duty, say walking past the lounge, you couldn't just see through it and see all these people relaxing and feel like, dang, I wish I wasn't on duty right now. And since we're here at the entrance, you'll probably notice the name of the lounge. It's not actually officially named Five Ford. I just wanted to give it some kind of name, and because it's on deck five and it's the Ford most position on the ship, I figured Five Ford, a little nod to TNG, would be kind of appropriate, but maybe it's too derivative. If you guys have a better idea, let me know down below. I personally love Ten Fords, so for me, I think this was a cool name. Overall then, I'm really happy with the design of the new Enterprise. I think it tastefully combines the stylings of the original set and influences with contemporary influences from the JJ shows and even contemporary sentiments of interior design. It also brings a more modern design level and detailing to a new audience. While I'm partial to having more carpeting on board starships for acoustic comfort, I'm okay with the reflective surfaces. It works well because they have high traffic areas and it is kind of the new look of Star Trek and it works fine. So overall then, I think a congratulations is in order to Jonathan Lee and the other members of the team such as set decorator Justin Craig for crafting an exceptional reinterpretation of a modern enterprise. What do you guys think? Do you think the Enterprise looks good or do you think it should have been a bit closer to the original design? Let me know down in the comment section below and if you want to see more videos like this, too bad this was way too hard and I'm not going to do this again anytime soon again. <laughs> I'll make more videos, just so I don't want to model everything again, okay? That was, that was a little crazy. Alright, see you guys in the next one.